All right, if you have a Bible, I'd love for you to meet me in Ephesians chapter number six. Um, when I was growing up, for a short period of time, I used to watch WWF. Some people in the room know what WWF, that's the World Wrestling Federation. And let me tell y'all, like, it was, it was like must-see TV. Um, Junkyard Dog, uh, Ric Flair, and uh, uh, Macho Man Randy Savage, and... And then, oh, we got some, okay, so y'all, 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 y'all remembering, all right? Uh, Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant, you know, I mean, this was, this was what I talked about at school with my friends, and man, I couldn't, I couldn't wait to, to talk about who beat who and who was challenging who, and the drama was so, like, exciting, but here's the thing, I'm not sure when I found out it wasn't really wrestling. I'm not really sure when I found that out. Um, I'm not sure that, that, that uh, when I found out that it was actually just entertainment, you know, that it was stage entertainment. There's like a group of producers and, and writers or whoever else behind the scenes kind of like organizing and influencing everything that, that we saw. And isn't that just like our lives as well? They're like, there, there are these, these things that are going on beyond our view. That is influencing our everyday lives. There are things that are happening outside of, of our view, influencing our reality. It's, it, it's an unseen realm. Sometimes this unseen realm is actually people, like real humans that we can't see but they have influence, they are, they are bosses, they are uh, people with powerful platforms. But then sometimes it's, it's not people, it's like something else. We don't know exactly, but we know that there's some forces at work behind the scenes. And it's illuminated clearly for us in a lot of different ways in our lives. We, we can see beauty in the world. Like as I drive around Baltimore and I see these beautiful and magnificent murals and I see uh, just awesome architecture. But at the same time, we can also see brokenness in our world as well. And this is why we're drawn to art and to stories and to films because they, they sometimes kind of pull the veil back and reveal to us deeper things and, and give us deeper meaning. And sometimes they're trying to help us kind of understand what's happening beyond the surface. This is why, like, movies like Star Wars that I grew up watching, you, you would hear them talk about the force. This is the underlying thing in, in Star Wars. It, it, it was about the force and, and these galaxies and, and, and this, this back and forth between good and evil. In Harry Potter, you have the, the world of, of wizardry where, where there's this tug of war of, 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 of light and, and darkness and good and evil. And, and then just like weird stuff, like leave the world behind. I don't know if anybody saw that, that recent movie where there's just a lot of weird stuff going on and a lot of weird stuff happening. And, and then even, even Jordan Peele's movie, Get Out, where it's, where, it's, where it's kind of shining a light on the darkness of racism. We know that there is an unseen realm that influences the world around us. And sometimes it's, it's, it, it shows up in, in funny ways when, like, you, you go to your refrigerator and something is missing. And, you know, like, somebody ate, somebody ate my food. Somebody moved. You know, well, maybe that's just my house. I, that, happened, that, happened, that happened all the time. Or, or maybe, I don't know, like, you're a teacher and you got this disruptive student that you just, it just get on your nerves every day. You guard yourself up to go in the classroom every day. And then that student is not there. you like, see... Somebody is working on my behalf. There's some force that knew I didn't have it today. And that kid did not show up. This week, we're kicking off a series called Powers That Be. Because there is an unseen realm. Real forces 
good and evil and light and darkness. And one of the main conduits of the powers are found in systems and found in governments. And God has established an order from the beginning of creation. When you read the creation story, it is very ordered and very specific. So God has created this realm that we're in of existence. There's an order to it. But somehow, some way, there was an infection called sin that separated us from God and, and, and caused the, the, the order to be chaotic and for us to deal with things and contend with things that we were never meant to contend with. So we fast forward in the Bible story to the New Testament where Jesus comes on the scene. And so Jesus is coming and his redemptive work was about reestablishing order and God reconciling power back to its rightful place through Jesus. Colossians chapter 1 outlines this for us. So in this series, here's, here's what we're going to do. We're going to explore language in the Bible that talks about this idea of the powers and this unseen realm that, that seems, I don't know, weird or confusing or maybe sometimes not even real because it's part of this, this immaterial world. But it is very much a real thing. And we need to have an understanding of what is going on around us. I have to give a few disclaimers as well as we enter into this series because this series is not about politics. Although we know that politics is very much a part of our world and we're entering into a political season where we have primary elections that are coming up uh, next month and, and we have uh, the general elections that will be happening this fall. So there's a lot of things going on politically and, and then we just have just stuff popping up all the time. Israel and Palestine and then we got stuff about party lines and and liberal and conservative, and, and then there, there are issues that we're talking about, abortion and gun rights. This, this series is not specifically talking about those things, although it's hard to even, like, say anything about it without offending somebody. But here's what we are focusing on. We're focusing on the kingdom of God, first and foremost. We're focusing on the witness of the church, that is us who are following Jesus. What does that look like? And how did Jesus deal with the powers that be? And finally, what does authentic community look like in the era of dysfunctional and divisive political systems? Now, although this series is not specifically about politics, I need to challenge us with this. We cannot retreat from the chaos of injustice and the political upheaval that we are experiencing. But we must be a clear and authentic witness of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, who is Jesus, by speaking truth to power. Now we need to know the truth and what the truth says. But this week, we're starting out with this fundamental understanding of who or what our opponent is. So we're starting in this letter written to Jesus followers by a man named Paul in a place called Ephesus. And in this letter called Ephesians, it's sort of a thematic overview. And it's about like, okay, how do I follow Jesus? What does it mean to be the church? And you go through all of these things that Paul is writing about, light and darkness and prayer and unity in the church, freedom from death, all of these different things that, that he's talking about. 
And then he closes with one final thing that he wants to illuminate for us that's very specific, and this is our starting point this weekend. So we're land in Ephesians chapter number 6, starting at verse 10. We'll have the words up on the screen. Here we go. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, tell your neighbor, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand. Simple subject this weekend to kick off this series, Powers That Be, Behind the Scenes. That's what we're talking about today, behind the scenes. This is not a message specifically about the armor of God or specifically about spiritual warfare. That is important. We will touch on that. That is a whole series within itself. But instead, we're going to back up a little bit and we're going to examine where this guy Paul is saying the battle is really taking place. Now, you got to understand that this is very relevant to the people living in Ephesus and even people living in other places. It is thought that this letter that was written by Paul when he was in prison uh, was circulated to other um, groups of believers in other places besides Ephesus. And the reason why this is really important is because in a lot of ways, this group of Jesus followers, they were a political minority. And this is what this means. They were a political minority because they lived within the Roman Empire, but their king is Jesus. That's who they submit to. And the question is, okay, how do I follow Jesus while under the authority of Rome and the power of Caesar? If, if Rome is not who I ultimately submit to, and if Caesar isn't my king but Jesus is, then how do I stay true to who I say I am and what I believe? The same is true for us and relevant for us today. How do we follow Jesus while being submitted to the U.S. government? How do we follow Jesus when we don't want to follow the authority or we don't agree with the authority of the president or the local officials or any of these people who are in power or the powers that be? How do we do that? Well, first, we need to understand the broader context and what's happening behind the scenes. So I think there are four things, if you're taking notes, four things that I think we can conclude from what Paul is writing to these Jesus followers in Ephesus that is very much related to us today. And I think it falls into two categories. I think it falls into the category of awareness. So Paul is trying to elevate our awareness and then tell us what our action should be. So here we go. Point number one, very, very general. The world is a spiritual place, not really a a revelation for a lot of us. But when he uses the phrase heavenly realms in verse 13, he's talking about beyond the material world. Well, what is the material world? It's the things that you can touch, you can see, you can taste, like all of that stuff, the physical material world world. He's saying beyond that. But here's the thing about the material world. Many things in the material world, when we see science or we understand more of science, 
and we see all of these amazing things in biology and, and just in the world in general, it hints that there is another dimension, that there is something else going on around us. Matter of fact, I was just having this conversation last week um, with, uh, matter of fact, I think Sophia and, and Torrance, I was just, we were just talking about traveling, and we were talking about traveling out west, and, and I love to travel out west. My wife and I, we, we, have, we have gone out west, and, and it has literally like changed our lives, because when you see these mountains, and when you see places like the Grand Canyon, and that's a picture of, of, of a volcano in Nicaragua that I had a chance to see in. And all of these amazing things, it, it points to something beyond this world. That, that there, is, there is something greater going on beyond this realm. When we think about creation, we think about the miracle of life. We think about all of these, these things that are just yeah, we know how they happen, but we don't know how they happen. There's a recent Barna study that says 80% of people believe in the spiritual dimension. That's not shocking to us. 77% say they believe that there is a higher power. So we know, for the most part, that the world is a spiritual place, which is why you hear people say, like, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. They, they recognize that there's something, something else going on. Now, part of the reason why they're saying that, just as a side note, is, is we've seen abuse and manipulation and control and religion and religious practices that we're not feeling. Again, that's a whole separate subject. But the point is, is that the world is a spiritual place. And for the most part, we recognize that. We know that. Second thing that Paul is saying here is that there are two main powers, good and evil. Again, not shocking, not a revelation to us. And that's how we kind of categorize these forces. It's either good or, or, or it's either bad. It's either light or darkness. And we see this every single day. We can uh, attest to this. Sometimes in the same people. I mean, like. One day you this, one day, I mean, like, well, which one is it? Is it good or bad, you know? And we all, have those, we all have those moments, right? But we see a lot of good in the world, like this recent story that I saw that was just so moving to me. It's the NCAA tournament. Anybody in the basketball know the women are playing for the championship today and the men tomorrow. And, and earlier in the tournament, uh, Yale was in the tournament. And uh, Yale was playing... Uh, I forget the team that they were playing, but, you know, they're underdog. They're, they're, you know, Ivy League team. They're not expected to go far. And normally what happens when teams play in the NCAA tournament, their band travels with them, you know, the little pep band, right? Well, Yale was on spring break. So, you know, their pep band was just on spring break. So they didn't, they didn't have a pep band. Well, the University of Idaho, of all places, decided to step in and be their pep band. And not just step in and be their pep band, but somehow, some way, uh, a phone call was made and, and the athletic director filled it, and then he asked the band uh, director, hey, would you consider doing it? And the band director sent out a message, and within two days, he had the amount of people needed to, to be a band. Then they had to learn the song. So he sent out the, the, the song, uh, the fight song for the school, and here's the thing. They only practiced the song as a full band for 30 minutes. They had to learn it on their own and then learn it, uh, practice it 30 minutes before they had to go and play. And then on top of that, showed up to the arena with Yale shirts on. This is good in the world. We, we, we see these kinds of things and they move us. But we also see evil around us and we see it and we feel it and we sense it like even in our own city that has struggled with the murder rate for so long but side note by the way it, it's down 20 percent and we should be celebrating that I just want to make note of that I mean we 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 see things like trafficking 
and these real evil people that do scams on folks, you know, like sending these emails and all this, trying to take people's money and all kind of stuff. And this is relevant to us because you know what happens? We get mad about this stuff, which we should. And I love that Paul also addresses this when he's writing to Christians in Rome, the center of, you know, this Roman occupation. He tells them, hey, listen, I know evil stuff has happened, but don't return evil for evil, but repay uh, evil with good. That's how we are supposed to show up in the world. So number one, world is the spiritual place. Number two, the two main powers, good and evil. But then number three, there are two forces associated with good and evil. It's God and the devil. Now, here's where it starts to get a little murky for us. It starts to get a little murky because of what or who are behind the forces. The scriptures tell us it's God and, and Satan or the devil or whatever word you want to use. But Paul echoes this in his writings in Ephesians 6. He says the devil schemes. He says rulers and authorities and powers of this dark world and spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. He is being very clear of who's behind what. But we struggle with this, and it gets a little murky for us because, ah, like, you know, I, I maybe think God is good, but then, like, there are these bad things that happen. I don't know why they happen, but if God is good, like, why did he? I, again, that's a whole separate subject, but the only thing that I can tell you about that is, is that God is love, and part of God being love is him allowing choice in the world. Again, that's a whole separate subject, but, but, we, but we struggle with, with this whole thing. But you know what I think we struggle with even more? We struggle even more with this association of evil being with the devil or Satan. Well, maybe depending on how you grow up. I didn't. Like, that became very clear to me. But, but I think we struggle with this in part because of, I think, some of these elementary um, images that we grew up with. Like, I used to watch Tom and Jerry growing up, and then there was, like, this, 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 little, this little devil, you know, and they had the pitchfork, and he was red, had the little tail, and that stuff ain't real. You know, like, like we, we, we know that that isn't real. But here's the thing. It's far from true. Like, there is an enemy that is behind evil. And some things may have seemed far-fetched for us or make believe, maybe even elementary, but that is what our adversary hopes would happen. I love this quote by C.S. Lewis. He says, there are two equal and opposite eras into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an existence and unhealthy interest in them. I think most of us fall into the first category of this kind of like nonchalant or like dismissiveness around evil and the existence of it, of a, of a, of a real force being behind it. A lot of that is executed for us via distraction to just kind of distract us and get us thinking or focusing on something else. And this is why Paul is being very clear that, hey, listen, there's a real fight going on. I need to turn your attention to what's really happening beyond the surface. And so this idea of distraction, like what our enemy or what our adversary does is, he says, oh, well, you know what? Let's just get them focused on insults. Yeah, let's insult them. Let's, let's, let's get them fighting with each other because he said this and, and she said that and I feel insulted. Like, let's, let's get them focused on that or personal attacks on freedoms. Let's, let's, let's get them all riled up about that. Or let's make them think, let, let's make them think that everything will be okay if we just get this person out of office and we get this person in. Let's get them focused on it. Let's get them fighting about that. Let's get them getting their efforts into, into that because that'll, that'll get them riled up. Or let's just manipulate and hijack language. Like you can't say this word anymore because now it means this. And Well, no, it don't mean this to me. It means this to me. And No, 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 you wrong. Let's, let's get them fighting about all of that stuff or create derogatory labels to just slap on 
to one another. And let's get them fighting about that and devaluing people's um, values and, and, and what they believe. And let's not get them really focused on the issues or the stories or the real people behind these issues. Let's, let's just make them nameless and faceless. Or let's just distract them with comfort. Let's make them feel good. Let's just make them like, oh, that was dope. Ah, yeah, let's just, let's just insulate them with all the stuff that just numbs them to what's really choking the life out of them. And then let's threaten to take the comfort away and watch them go at it. So, to the Ephesians, it was not about Caesar. This is what Paul is saying. This, this ain't about Caesar. This is not about Roman policy that is trying to crush you and suppress you and control you. Yes, that is important. To us, it ain't about liberal or conservative. It ain't about agendas. It ain't about how I feel about this policy or that policy. I'm not saying that I'm dismissing your feelings. I'm saying that's not primary. And Paul is saying, listen, we got to stay focused on the real fight and what's happening behind the scenes. This is what he's, this is what he's trying to say. So here's what he's saying. World is a spiritual place. That's about awareness. Two main powers, good and evil, that's awareness. Two forces behind the powers, God and the devil, that's awareness. The last point is about action. Our role as Jesus followers is to stand our ground. That's the action for us. This is why he says, be strong in the Lord in his mighty power, not yours. You don't have enough of it in his mighty power. And then he says, put on the full armor of God. He gives a breakdown this week. May, let that be your reading, to just read about the armor of God. What, what is that? Because we're not, we're not going to dive into that. But, but why, 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 is he, why is he saying this? Why is he talking about standing your ground? Why is he talking about putting on the armor of God? He's saying this is because the expectation is to participate, not hide and avoid. That's the expectation. This is what I was saying earlier. We can't shrink back from injustice. We can't shrink back from the political upheaval that's happening around us. No, 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 no. We got to be in this fight. We just need to know who's who. We need to know who the enemies are. We need to know, like, like what are we attacking? Because we're supposed to be participating. So how do we do this? By being both a reflection of God's kingdom and by modeling what it means to be a part of of God's kingdom. I love this quote by theologian N.T. Wright. I'm reading a book right now that he's written called Jesus and the Powers. And this is what he says. He says, the church has the responsibility of modeling what a genuine new creational community might look like and be the sign to the principalities and the powers that they are not in charge. That's who we are to be in the world. That is what our witness is to look like. Not by telling people, hey, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. No, just by how we live. That is the witness. Now, there will be times when we need to be vocal, but it's less about being vocal. It's about how we live and how we show up. And then earlier in Ephesians 3, Paul uses this phrase where he's talking about and the manifold wisdom of God. Or, or it can be translated, the many-colored or the multicolored wisdom of God being a, a, a reflection of the church. 
This is how we show up. Like all of our, all of our diversity, all of our, our gifts, all of our differences, we show up with all of that as a manifold witness, as a multicolored witness. Side note, this is why it's so important for me, for us, to have a, a cross-cultural, multi-ethnic church. Now, that is, that is represented in our city, but a big part of it is how God's kingdom shows up in and through us. And so the unity within the church is a sign to the principalities and the powers that Jesus is Lord and they are not. So, a couple of things. We are to stand our ground through prayer and our witness. When Paul is encouraging his protege, Timothy, he says to Timothy, so that Timothy can communicate to the community that he's leading. Hey, we are to pray for all people, especially those who are in power, especially those who are in office. We are to pray for them. That's part of how we show up. And then our witness is how we live, which is people of love. Let me see if I can land a plane for us like this. One of my favorite movies growing up, and I used to watch movies all the time with my dad. My dad is like the ultimate philosopher. And like, I mean, he's just pulling stuff out of stuff we watching. And now I'm like 45 remembering stuff that he told me when I was, you know, I wasn't even 10 yet. And so one of my our favorite movies to watch together was a movie called The Predator. And uh, in this movie, Arnold Schwarzenegger is the main character in, in, the, in the movie, The Predator, and his name is, is Dutch. And the premise is there's a, a paramilitary special forces rescue team. They're on mission in like the middle of the jungle in Central America, and they're trying to get these hostages out. These are like high level people, and they're trying to get these, these hostages out. They're under attack by these uh, insurgents. And so while, listen, while the rescue team led by Arnold Schwarzenegger, Dutch is his name. While, while they're on mission, they don't realize that they're being hunted. And so there's one man in the group that he, he, he's seen a little something. And he's spooked. He's like, yo, something is out there. Like, I, I seen it. And, and then all of a sudden, the, the, the entire group, they, they start getting wind that something is out there too. And one of the commanders just commands everybody to just start shooting. Just shoot, just shoot, 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 shoot. So they shooting the guns and they just shooting everywhere. Shooting in the darkness, they can't see anything. It's a very irrational and, em and emotional response. Here's the thing. The predator gets hit, but it ain't enough to do anything. It ain't enough to slow him down. But then Dutch realizes, hey, wait a minute. I see what's happening here. I, I see that there's something out here and, and, and I see what's going on. Okay. Dutch starts to change his strategy now that he's aware. He's changing his action. And he understands that this predator can see me, but I can't necessarily okay. see him. Look for the key. But I know he's out there. And part of the reason why is because of this, this technological advancement that the predator has. Where he's got this, this cloaking device where you can't detect him. So he can just move about and just kill at will. But Dutch figures out, hey, something else is, is going on. I see how the predator is moving. And then all of a sudden, Dutch realizes like, hey, if I cover myself with mud, all over my body it is a camouflage that prevents the predator from seeing the heat from my body so now he moves from trying to avoid and run to now he can actually fight and engage and pursue and eventually win and he does 